Hello everyone, thank you for gathering with us today for our rest Sunday. Uh, before we go on to um, worship and then we'll have a teaching, I just want to remind you that next Sunday at 5 p.m. we will be back at the live to dance, live to dance, not live, live to dance studio. 308 9th Avenue North Seattle. We would love to join you. It's going to be a special Sunday as we gather again to grow in community and also to pursue the heart of Jesus. Um, wherever you're at, I just want to encourage you. Would you set all distractions aside? Let this not be just another routine, typical Sunday where we come and we check off the box of gathering in a community of faith and then we go on back to perhaps what really matters in life. And I'm not saying that's true about you. Come on, all of us at Belltown Church, we have the perfect heart, right? I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So I just want to encourage you just to set all distractions aside. And though we are not together in person, there's just something transcendent there's something tangible about the presence of the Holy Spirit. That whenever we come with hearts open, hearts hungry, that He is faithful to meet us. So today, do you need healing? Come on, I'm believing that the Holy Spirit will bring healing to your life. Do you need peace? I believe that Jesus is the source of our peace. And the Holy Spirit can bring you peace. Do you need joy? Do you need breakthrough? Whatever it is, let our hearts be hungry and open today. So would you pray with me, Holy Spirit? We ask for your presence to come. Fill every space where people are gathering, whether we're in our bedroom, whether we're in our living room, in our car, at our workplace, wherever we're at, Holy Spirit, come and rest. We long for more of you. We trust you. We love you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. Yeah. 
begin to welcome more of his presence. Say 
talk to you guys about the resurrection of unity. I'm going to open with the prayer of Jesus in John 17. So if you do have a Bible or a phone app, I'm going to John 17, 16 through 23. Now this is kind of in the middle of Jesus' prayer, so I'm just going to jump right in and that's why you have no context, but he's, um, Jesus is praying right now. John 17, 16. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so that they can be made holy by your truth. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Hallelujah. I pray that they will all be one, yes. just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, I am in you. And may they be in us yes. so that the world will believe that you sent me. Right. I have given them the glory you gave me so that, we, so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me yes. and that you love them just as much as you love me. Yeah. Jesus said that about us. Yeah. He said that God loves us yes. just as much as God loves Jesus. Yes. Crazy. Crazy. When 9-11 happened, when 9-11 happened, it was said to be a time when the nation was the most unified. Yeah. If you guys remember, I was, I was young, but I was old enough to remember this. Um, I think I was 11. I think I was 11. It was said to be the time when the nation was the most unified. But we weren't unified by fear, by hate or war. We were unified by a certain collective vulnerability. Mm -hmm. It's in times of greatest weakness that we can find ourselves in our greatest strength when we are not alone, but in unity with one another. 
in the aftermath of 9-11, we all could relate to each other in our vulnerability. And therefore, we had this deep connection that led to a deep compassion for one another. I want to talk about the resurrection of unity. And God's original plan for us is unity. It always has been unity. Yes. Yeah. In the beginning, God created humanity in unity with each other and in unity with himself. Mm-hmm. God walked with them in the garden. There was peace. There was no separation. And then obviously when sin was introduced, there was a huge shift and brokenness was introduced. Yeah. Not only between us and God, but between Adam and Eve and between human to human and friend to friend. Yes. That is where it all begins. Why were we created? How were we designed? We are designed for unity, to be one with God and to be one with each other. We always have been, and we always will be. This type of unity originates from love. It originates first from the very heart of God, the source of love, and the source of unity. And this love is meant to be like a root system in the depths of us that grows beneath everything that's happening on top. And it keeps everything in place. It holds us together. This unity does not come from ideas. It does not come from the head at all. This unity comes from an intimate connection of soul to soul, heart to heart. Mm. This unity does not come from maintaining a rigid belief system that everyone must adhere to and conform to. This unity does not come from a religious mindset. Religion is not unity. Conformity is not unity. Unity is something that we really struggle with. (laughs) Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard? Unity is so hard, for one, because we have a dark spiritual power working against us. Because unity is the plan of God, then the enemy will always relentlessly oppose that unity. But unity is also hard because we have a misunderstanding of what true unity is. We cling tightly to conformity, to false peace, and to fear. We cling to control, and we lose sight of love. We lose sight of understanding, compassion, and respect. I always compare unity to a dance. I think of those like Olympic synchronized swimmers. Or just anyone who's in a group dancing and they're coordinating with each other. There's this sense of trust. You cannot successfully be united when you are moving in fear, when you want to control those around you and their actions. You cannot have unity without trust and vulnerability with one another. Scripture talks about this unity a lot like the body with many parts Mm -hmm. and how each part has a different role, but they work together. One is not better than the other. They depend on each other. They trust each other. They do not control each other. To understand unity, you have to understand that every person has a unique part to play. That diversity can be your greatest strength. Mm -hmm. Diversity in the church is its greatest strength, And without it, we are dismembered and therefore useless. God's original plan was unity, and God's plan for us is still unity. This is the heart of Jesus. This is seen in the prayer that I opened with. In this prayer, Jesus prays for us. He prays for you and me, and his prayer is for everyone who will ever believe in his message. And the prayer is for unity. That is what Jesus desires. That's what he's praying for. Mm -hmm. It's not just you and I that pray. Jesus prayed. 
And when he prayed, he prayed for unity on, on purpose. That was his main point. Because it's, a, it's God's original plan, and it's still God's plan. Yes. It's God's desire for us. It's God's end game. Unity is heaven on earth. Wow. When we see unity in the church, we will see revival on the earth. Wow. When we see unity in the church, we will see revival on the earth. When we pray God's will be done, we are praying for this unity. Yeah. Yeah. Because unity is the heart of God. And this is exactly why Jesus came to die. This is exactly what was accomplished on the cross. Not just that we are no longer separated from God, but that we are no longer separated from each other. Yeah. There is no longer a separation. We are in unity with God. But we are now capable of being in unity with one another. That's good. We have access to this unity. The supernatural love of Jesus produces a resurrection of unity in our lives Amen. and in the church. Amen. The resurrection of unity is the message that the Lord is speaking to me and that I believe that I am and to bring to you this morning the resurrection of unity. Let me tell you this. It's okay to let something die when you know that it will resurrect in Jesus' name. Mm. It's okay to let false, broken things die wow. when you know that real things, everlasting things will rise. Over the past few years, things have gotten a little bit wild. <laughs> and some people have felt that unity in the church is just being torn. Sure. It's being torn. But I don't think that. I don't think that unity has been shattered. I believe the facade of unity has been shattered. Yeah. Yeah. I believe that now is the time for the church to be the pursuers not of the facade of unity anymore, but to be pursuers of true unity that is alive in Jesus Christ. Come on. Come the on. church has too long been a place where fake unity has been held over its people, where people come to church with masks, but not these masks, with masks that hide who they really are, yeah. that hide their vulnerability, that hide, they, they can't be honest, they can't be open. They can't have questions or doubts. Yeah. The church has too long been a place where legalistic theology and even skin color has reigned supreme and created a Truman show like a effect, this facade of perfection and peace Come on. and harmony. Come on. That's good. But the unity that comes from Jesus is intimate and it's messy yeah. and it's diverse. Yeah. There is an example I want to show you of this type of unity or this type of disunity in the Bible that the early church struggled with also. It's in Galatians 2, 11. Galatians 2, 11 through 16. Galatians 2. But when Peter came to Antioch, this is Paul speaking. But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face. For what he did was very wrong. This is Peter, the rock on whom I will build my church. This is that Peter, the one Jesus said, you are the rock, I will build my church. Mm -hmm. So Paul had to come to Peter and, and oppose him. Paul said, I had to oppose him to his face for what he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with Gentile believers who were not circumcised. But afterward, when some friends of G James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. Mm. He was afraid of criticism from the people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy, and even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. When I saw that they were not following the truth 
of the gospel message, I said to Peter in front of all the others, since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, why are you now making these Gentiles follow Jewish traditions? You and I are Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles. Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Hallelujah. Christ, not by obeying the law. That's right. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be right with God because of our faith in Christ, yes. not because we have obeyed the law. Yeah. For no one will ever be made right by God by obeying the law. Right. What is happening here is that Peter preached, accept, he preached acceptance. He said, oh, Gentiles, you can come. You can come. He preached acceptance. He preached diversity. And yet when it came down to it, he still chose to preserve a sense of harmony with his people rather than to introduce and embrace diversity. He was afraid of conflict. And so he chose to preserve harmony instead. Mm -hmm. Harmony is not unity. He was afraid of criticism. He was afraid of backlash. He was afraid of the mess. He was afraid of the confrontation. Peter was acting as if he was unified, but then behind their backs, he was taking sides against them. Mm -hmm. He was playing both sides. He was not genuinely accepting their diversity. Paul called out Peter because he saw the danger of his hypocritical actions. Peter's facade was leading others astray. This is what I mean when I say the shattered unity is a facade. It's okay sometimes for things to shatter. Unity is not gone from us. It's not gone. Unity is rising. Unity is not broken. Unity is being resurrected. The facade is gone, and that feels scary. It feels vulnerable. The facade is gone, and it's uncomfortable for some. But do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not let fear get the best of you. See the hope in Jesus. Look at the room that is now being made for true unity to rise. Yes. So good. Yeah. Jesus told us that it was love that brings unity. Yeah. Yeah. Love. Yes. Babe, can you come? In Jesus' prayer and his teachings, he never said that the old covenant brought unity. He never said that by following these regulations, you would find unity. He said that following the greatest command, love brings unity. We are so much better together in all our differences, in all our perspectives. And if we as the church cannot learn to live in unity, then how can we expect to teach anybody else? Remember this. Religion is for the religious. Religion is for the religious. But love is for the family of God. Amen. None of this unity is possible without love. We must move in love, speak in love, and listen in love. And they will know us, and they will recognize us by our love. They, they will know us, not by our religion. They will know us not by our theology. They will know us not by our everyone having the same idea about heaven, hell, the end times. They will know us by our love. Amen. Amen. 
they will recognize us and they will recognize Jesus by our love. Lord Jesus, that is all we ask for. We want to represent you. That is what we're here for. To show the world you. And we can't show them you without love and unity. It's what you said. It's what you said. that the world will know that you sent me, that they can be one so that the world will know that you sent me. We have to be one for the world to see that we have to be one for the world to see it. We have to be one for the world to be able to see it. Lord, show us first. The problem isn't out there. The problem isn't liberal theology. The problem isn't LGBTQ members. The problem is our disunity and our lack of love. They will never see it without it. They will never see you without it. Lord, let us represent you better. Yes. And just as you resurrected from the grave, I pray a resurrection of unity in the church today. A resurrection of unity in the church today. The old is gone and the new is rising. And it start right here in Makotio and let it start in Belltown. That the new is rising. True unity is rising. And let us be a part Let's not stand on the sidelines. Yes, Lord God. Waiting for the world to just change or burn. But Lord, let us be a part. Change our hearts. Change our hearts. Change my heart. Yes, Lord. my heart, Lord. Yes, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I just want you, Jesus, and only you. Change my heart. Yes. That the world would know you. Put your hands out if you if you'd like. I just encourage you to take this moment to really internalize that. Change my heart. Change my heart. thank you for your faithfulness and we never have to be afraid because you always come through and when things seem broken we don't have to be afraid because you always resurrect them you always take what the enemy meant for evil and you resurrect new things so let us not be a people of fear but a people of power a people of love and a people of courage people of boldness thank you for what you're doing here in this church 
I already sense that this unity is already birthed and rising in this church. And I just thank you for that. And I just pray more of that and more of that and more across the whole city of Seattle. Yes, sir, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.